Uh, my name is Bridget Gallagher. My firm, Gallagher Group LLC, um, has worked with news organizations, media development organizations, and the foundations and individuals who fund them since 2010. Um, so I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I think this is my third global conference and seventh conference overall. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Karen Martin, for introductions. Thank you very much. And our colleague, Michael Randall, will be joining us from GFMD in, um, in just a moment. He's going to be live from Zoom. He apologizes he couldn't be here, but we are so glad that he is here uh, virtually. My name is Karen Martin. I am the Director of Development at GIJN. I've been doing that since one year. Um, my background is in journalism. After I got my master's degree, I went and worked uh, in daily news and television. Um, it was not long before I realized I didn't like television. <laughs> um, I also didn't like the daily news environment, which was so fast paced, and no matter what your story looked like, it went on air that night. Uh, there was just no time for investigation. There was no time for, for extensive storytelling. And so I just decided I needed to be in print. And so I made the transition to, uh, to print because I wanted to continue that storytelling. And while I was working in the print space, often as a freelancer, um, I got connected with a nearby foundation. And they were expanding and they were looking for somebody to handle their grants who had familiarity with our region. And uh, so I joined as their first program officer, or their first grants officer, and that gave me what I call an insider look at the grants process. So I helped administer the requests for proposals. I met with applicants during the grant process. I went on site visits to learn more about the organizations and how they worked. And I sat in on several board committee meetings to hear how the decisions are made. So from that, I learned what makes a grant proposal competitive? What are the, what are the board members talking about? What are they looking for? And it is a competition. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So knowing that I had that knowledge, but also the passion for storytelling that I think all of us do, um, I decided I wanted to combine those, those talents, uh, those strengths, to help NGOs tell their stories better and help them get the funding for all the good that we all are doing in the world. So over the past 20 years, I have worked with NGOs that are addressing poverty, food insecurity, uh, refugees, displaced families, um, education disparity, and now, of course, investigative journalists with GIJN. So I feel like I have come full circle uh, in the journalism space and in the nonprofit philanthropy fundraising space. Um, I love what I do. I love grant writing. I love the process. And um, I hope that you will like it a little bit more um, after, after our session today. And now I think if we can, Olaf, if we can get Michael up on the screen and, and allow him to introduce himself. Oh, there's Michael. There he is. I got you. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I am very sorry I can't be with you today, but uh, I will do my best to engage virtually. Um, I wish I had as interesting a biography as Karen has. Um, I've pretty much been stuck in the BBC for the best part of two decades, uh, but I did leave eventually in 2017, and since then I've been working on a, on a freelance basis, uh, supporting media development agencies across Europe to... Um, pitch for funding to access funding, mainly from European governments, the US government, uh, and the institutions of the European Commission. Uh, so I specialize also in the process of designing projects, putting together log frames, theories of change, uh, the actual writing of the applications, um, and advising also about how organizations should position themselves strategically in order to maximize their chances of uh, success. Mm -hmm. So I work with um, a very wide range of different organizations now. Um, I you know, starting with kind of, you know, the top end with Internews, but I also work with a number of uh, local organizations. For example, I 
write um, grant applications for the um, National Union of Somali Journalists. So, you know, very different contexts, very different grant sizes, but still the same skills and the same experience, you know, um, coming to bear. Um, so uh, the last session, I have to say, I found uh, very rewarding. It's been interesting for me to get more of an insight into the work that can be done with uh, with individuals, uh, with foundations. You know, this is not so much my area of expertise, but plenty of my clients or organizations that I work with on a regular basis, they obviously are keen to explore the full range of, uh, of funding opportunities. Um, so I think you know, it is important to understand that uh, there is huge room for diversification when it comes to uh, fundraising, um, a lot of different uh, opportunities out there. Uh, and uh, and I think you know it's important as a base to really understand the added value that your organization brings and the unique um, selling proposition that you have um, and to stick with it. <laughs> That's kind of you know I think the main area in which uh, I try to work with um, with my clients is to ensure that they, put their emphasis on what they do well and don't try and just stray into areas that they in which they either have no experience or feel uncomfortable because there's plenty of work out there, you know, whatever you do. I and mean, the media development sector is still thankfully very rich uh, and, you know, has a significant um, level of donor attention. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, so just so that we can learn a little bit about you and kind of what sort of resources you're working with, um, show of hands if you are from an organization with a staff of five or fewer small shops. Yep, about 10 of you. Um, more than five, but fewer than 10 people? One, seven. Um, and more than 10? Okay. So some bigger organizations here too. Pretty well-rounded. Um, and for how many of you is fundraising your primary responsibility? Most of your time is spent that way. About a dozen of you. Um, and the rest of you, I assume, are you know, journalists first, fundraisers second, wearing multiple hats, <laughs> keeping lots of balls in the air. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, well, hopefully this session will have a little something for everybody. Um, Olaf, can we have the slide deck back, please? Thank you. Um, so Karen, with all the knowledge that you have gained from your varied careers as <laughs> a journalist, uh, as a program officer, um, can you take us through the sort of proposal writing process? Sure thing. Um, I'm actually going to stand up if, if anybody doesn't mind so that I'm not looking over Bridget's <laughs> shoulder or looking over mine. I'm just going to get up the whole TV thing. I'm okay with it. Um, so there's a couple things to take in mind as we think about the proposal uh, process. And we'll walk through that first. Um, oh, I guess I should take the little clicky thing. <laughs> That's what it's called in, in tech world. <laughs> the, technical, the clicky thing. The technical term. So uh, this might be very, very basic for a number of folks in here, especially because we had a number of people who have uh, larger shops and, and have experience or are the sole fundraisers in your organization. So some of this might be uh, a little basic, but it's a, a review for folks for whom this might be the first time that they are working on it. Uh, what is a grant? A grant is funding awarded to an organization for a specific purpose uh, with terms and conditions. So that means you are committing, it's like a contract, you are committing to uh, to doing what you say you're going to do. Um, I've been told to move over, sorry. Um, it can typically have an application process or can simply be awarded. Those are the angel grants that, that you hear of uh, and you love to have if it's possible. Um, and typically requires post-project reporting. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's so important. What not to do. I like to start here, and we talked about this in the prospecting section this morning. Don't chase the money simply because it's available. We talked about, you know, there are, you'll hear a, perhaps a, a wonderful opportunity for a, a grant for 400 euro, and you think, that's terrific, we're going to apply for that. What I warn applicants is that 
um, sometimes if you chase the money and it's not quite what your mission is, organizations might have what we call mission creep, where they add things for the sake of the grant. And then what happens is when that grant funding expires, you're left with a program that you're either going to have to secure more funding for or have to cut that program. So make sure as you're applying for a grant that it's something that is integral to your mission. Um, don't seek funds to cover a deficit. Um, foundations and funders don't want to hear, well, we, we didn't budget appropriately. We're, we're 30, 30K euros short, so can you give us some money? Um, don't assume the funder knows your organization. It's a competitive process. There are lots of good people doing great things in the world, and they're all applying for money as well. So you need to be sure to tell your story and to make it stand apart. Don't understand the, underestimate the competitive process, and don't wait until the last minute. Sometimes you get into these things and you find out they're very complex. So start as soon as you can and take a look at all the requirements. And, and by the way, um, these slides are on the tip sheet that will be in the GIJC 23 uh, Resource Center, so don't feel compelled to, to take notes. Um, so as part of the process, I always like to make sure that you know who is the lead writer or organizer. Sometimes that's the same person, and for the sake of this session, we'll say that is, and I'll say it's me. Um, but who else needs to be involved? Because you're gonna need to talk about your budget. You're gonna need to talk about human resources, how much staff time is going to be involved with your project. So think about all the people who need to contribute to the grant proposal. Who needs to approve it? Make sure that whoever is the highest up in your organization that needs to sign the confirmation that as you submit the proposal, they know this is coming and that this is an institutional priority and that um, you have the green light to proceed. And then who needs to sign it as well? Could be the same person who needs to approve it. Um, oh, a really pixelated uh, image of the life cycle of a grant for those who haven't done it yet. Um, Project development, pretty much everybody is familiar with that, right? Because that's what you're doing day in, day out on a, on a consistent basis. Um, number two, identify funding prospects. And that we talked a little bit about that in the prospecting section, but we can talk further in the Q&A if you have some questions. Uh, you prepare your proposal, you submit it. Uh, hopefully the award, uh, the, the grant is awarded. Hooray. Uh, you conduct the project. And then here, the tracking and reporting that I've written and read is very, very important because funders want to know that. They want to know that you're doing what you said you were going to do and that they can see the results that they intended when they made the grant. Um, so it's important to be able to track all that. I, I know somebody who says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it which I love. So be thinking about ways that you can measure the impact that you're making through your grant. Um, and, and, you know, kind of it's, it benefits you as well because by being very thorough and showing the grant maker how you have tracked the impact and what you've done, it builds trust with that grant maker and they may be uh, more likely to talk about a future proposal. There's no guarantee, but at least you'll be open to the conversation. And then reporting, also very important, because um, they, the funders need to know. They need to know that their funding is making a difference and that you use the money as you said you were. And honestly, they know you're gonna do good things and they wanna be able to talk about it. So reporting is very important as well. So in my, in my process, I like to go from the back, um, reviewing the grant guidelines all at once. Um, and, I, and I tell this story on myself as, as a horror story. Um, when I first got started, and this was years and years and years ago, um, before the internet, um, 
the very end of the grant guidelines said, you know, make sure that your board member signs this. And it was hard copy back in those days. There was no online portals. I mean, it was all hard copy. <laughs> Do you remember um, going to the FedEx store, like knowing when all the FedEx stores closed <laughs> to be able to ship your applications off? <laughs> this is worse. It had to be signed by our board chair, and he was in Paris. And I was in the US. <laughs> so FedEx the proposal to his signature. He FedExed it back to me. And so we, it, extra time, extra money, because I did not read the guidelines. So heads up. Uh, review the application, everything that's going to be needed so that you can figure out how can I share this with internally with folks who might need to help me put this together. Um, and also, take a look at the application now online. A lot of applications have a character count or a word count, and that's very strict. If it says 500 characters, they mean 500 characters. If you write 501, it will start cutting off what you've just written. So, so take a look at that as well. Answer your key questions. That's your value proposition. We'll talk about that later. Create a budget. Um, that's just as much a part of the writing process as the writing is the grant because you want to make sure that your narrative matches your budget. If you are asking for 24,000 euro for a certain uh, position or a certain project, you want to make sure that what you're writing is 24,000 euro worth. After all this, that's when you start writing. Make a plan. Again, when is the application due? Uh, send your colleagues the questions that they have to help answer. So if you need help from HR regarding staffing, if you need help from finance regarding the budget. And what I like to do is create a screenshot of what they're asking, what the question is. Uh, there was a time when I would say, hi, can you help me with such and such? And then invariably, that person would call me back on our staff and say, well, why do I have to give you this broken down in this way? Now I just don't even, I skip that step. I take a screenshot and I say, this is what they want. Can you give that back to me, please? Um, the writer works on the narrative. The organizer helps complete the budget and matches it to the narrative, making sure that works. Um, then there's the internal review, because you want to make sure that everybody on your team knows where you're headed and what your plans are. And just so somebody doesn't later say, wait, I didn't know we were promising to do that. So make sure internally everyone has a chance to take a look. Uh, tell your reviewers how you would like to receive edits. Um, at JIGN, we do it with Google Docs, and we ask everybody to put in comments, not to make edits into the document itself, because then it, it kind of gets muddy sometimes. So we ask everybody to make comments. Um, Attention, again, to your word character count limits. Um, don't write 2,000 words if they ask for 1,000. Um, and ask your reviewers for a deadline for response. And as journalists, I think we're very attuned to that um, because you don't want to say, hey, get this back to me when you can because you need to keep the process moving. As the writer, as the organizer, you need to keep it moving. Um, then after you have all the edits, that's when you submit. This is my obsessive timeline. Um, I just throw in, threw in some dates. Uh, this was a hypothetical grant application with a deadline of 1 February. Um, I look over the application, and I put my initials there, look over the application, discuss with the manager. These are all things we just talked about, including the deadlines for when to return these things and getting it back. And it just, again, it keeps things on, on schedule. And, I will sometimes put this on a sticky note or print this out from my Excel file and stick it on my wall if I've got a, a, a project coming up, just so I remember that it's due. Uh, we also use project management software. We have an Asana um, program that we help keep these things moving as well. Now we're gonna turn it over to Michael for a bit. Hold off if we might switch back to Michael. Thank you, and Michael, uh, share your screen, please. Yeah. Let me know if you can see it. If you can see it. Yep, looks looks great. It's in edit mode if you can put it in, in present mode. Perfect. Brilliant. 
Okay. So I'm, I'm going to launch into a bit of a tangent here. As I mentioned earlier, my, my, my specialist area is in, uh, in government and EU funding. So I wanted to talk about, you know, what that involves in terms of um, the workload and the, the, the specific challenges. Um, uh, those who are in the last session will be throwing up their hands in horror as I launch into another into another PowerPoint presentation because uh, I, I can't see you, unfortunately. So if you start leaving the room or waving at me to stop, <laughs> I'm just going to plow on. But I will try to keep this reasonably tight. Um, I, a lot of this, you know, you will know already. Uh, and some of this we touched on in the previous session, too. Uh, what makes, you know, these big cumbersome proposals, these what makes applying to these large impersonal organizations different from the run of the mill and of you know, fundraising work that you might do. Um, it's more formalized, clearly, um, and you get much less human contact than you might do otherwise. So it is less interactive. All of your engagement with donors will tend to be through emails and, uh, and, and web interfaces. It's also significantly more vagarious. It's it's much more unpredictable. There are, it, it's you you can write a fantastic proposal that appears to tick all the boxes uh, and that really plays to your strengths and still not win, and you will never probably know why, uh, and it will eat at you for the rest of your life. But um, it, it 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 is uh, tougher. It's a tougher environment. It's much more competitive. Some of the programs are getting dozens, if not hundreds, of applications. You know, many of which don't stand an icicle chance in hell of being uh, of being funded. So, consequently, there is you know a, a, a lot more work involved because institutional donors they want to see so much from you in terms of not just the ideas that you're presenting, but reassurances that you as an organisation are going to be reliable that you have experience in doing this kind of work, that you can manage a grant uh, to the satisfaction of a donor concern. So there's a lot of work involved. I mean, I have written proposals that have run into well, well over 500 pages um, that have been taken to the donor in a wheelbarrow because you needed three hard copies and all of the supporting <laughs> documentation. You know, it's crazy. Luckily, a lot of that uh, is over and, you know, most donors would accept uh, entirely electronic applications, but still, there's a lot of things to think about, a lot of moving parts, and of course, uh, for several donors, particularly EU institutions, if you don't get it right, you will simply be rejected out of hand, and there's nothing you can do about it, uh, and it's, of course, you know, um, it, it's extremely galling, but uh, as that was you know, very rightly pointed out in the previous uh, presentation, it's all about uh, making sure that you have that whole process under control, that you know exactly what's expected of you, and that you allow plenty of time for pulling those those documents together, because the rules are stricter, uh, and uh, and they don't suffer fools gladly. Um, the, but, but naturally, because of all the uh, issues mentioned above, uh, the processes are slower, uh, and um, feedback, uh, if it happens at all, is usually quite limited. And one can understand it. There are capacity issues within donors, as there are within any, within any organization. And if they're getting hundreds of proposals, uh, their ability to provide detailed feedback on each one is is going to be limited. And there are, of course, exceptions to the rule. I you know, very much uh, welcome, for example, the uh, approach taken by um, State Department through its DRL program which generally speaking, you're allowed a call to discuss, you know, if, if, if you're not successful, uh, you, you have the opportunity to speak to a grants officer who will give you feedback on why uh, you didn't uh, make it this time around. Um, so what makes our life harder uh, when we're um, trying to access funding from these larger donors? They don't understand media so well. They don't necessarily have people in-house who appreciate the way media works and appreciate the overheads, particularly of something like investigative journalism. You know, they will assume that these things can be knocked out uh, uh, a couple a week and um, you know, they, don't, they, they shouldn't cost very much because how difficult can it be? You're getting your information off the internet anyway. <laughs> so there is a lack of appreciation of the real overheads, both in, term, both in finance and in resourcing of complex journalistic projects. Uh, and 
I do think that you know, proposals need to need need to really hit that message home. Uh, they need to make it absolutely clear that these are not crazy costs that you're just asking for to keep your organisation alive, and this is, these are the real overheads of doing work to the standard that you would expect uh, and that the donor needs. So um, there's a lot of work to be done in building a cultural understanding within the donor community of uh, editorial processes. And that's something we should all do whenever we have the opportunity to do so. Um, it's challenging because bigger donors like to lump in media development with all kinds of other areas of endeavor, um, particularly uh, civil society uh, work. Uh, and therefore, you get these very blurred lines between, you know, uh, editorial principles and values and pressures from donors to uh, cover certain themes or certain ideas. And again, it uh, as has been mentioned on several occasions in previous session on this one, uh, it, 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 you know, you are constantly... Uh, tempted to kind of modify or adapt what you do in order to meet donor priorities. Uh, and um, it's, yeah, it's a challenge. It, 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 uh, it's not the way it should be, frankly. Um, donors want too much. Um, I think everyone's going to agree with that. They want quick wins. They want to see the instant results from something, from processes that are actually likely to bear fruit only in the fullness of time, and it's extremely difficult to convince them otherwise. Um, and there's far too much emphasis on projects rather than institutional support and core funding. Uh, and this is something that is changing to a very small degree, but not quickly enough. Um, and the emergence of uh, new donors like the um, uh, International Fund for Public Interest Media um, do reflect an understanding that uh, media are in survival mode and therefore uh, there is a need to to support them financially to continue doing what they do. Uh, you'll see the word innovation in every single terms of reference uh, that you ever uh, access uh, and no one really knows what it means including the donors probably but of course they want the sexiest projects they want to feel that they're supporting the latest brightest thing um, so there is again pressure to kind of show evidence of innovation and I see all the time in proposals people trying to present ideas that really are not viable and totally unproven but do look a little bit different from what everyone else is proposing uh, and the problem with that is that if you get the grant then you need to deliver against them and sometimes it's easier said than done. Um, the issue of uh, of duplication of efforts is is, is well known to all and uh, and was covered at length in the previous session about the extent to which you know we need to be coordinating more about what's being done on a national and even regional level in terms of media development so we can look at ways of working together when it's possible and pooling resources again when it makes sense and also approaching donors as groups rather than individually uh, I, I think these are, these things are, are super important. And you'll all be very sensitive to the potential for donors to come in there and say, you know, we want this covered, we want that covered, um, with an eye often on their own visibility, um, uh, their own presence uh, and perception locally. Uh, and we fight the good fight. <laughs> Um, but again, it's 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 a kind of educational thing, and I think that uh, you know you see certain donors and institutions who now build that into their proposals and promise editorial independence, and we should take that with both hands. Against all of these challenges, why would you do this kind of work? And I I often ask myself this question, <laughs> but um, but of course you know. When it comes to the, the large donors, the EU and the US particularly, the grants are obviously much larger. Um, they also, you know, they they are committed to media development, you know, for the long term. Even if uh, they don't always <laughs> express it in the right way, you know, these this is not a whim or a, a short term action. Even if the funding is not for as long as you would like, you know, they are basically still there for you. And some of them, you know, like the Soros Foundation, for example, you know, they have been loyal and regular partners for media outlets for, for 
for, for, for the best part of two decades. And so it's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, that in itself is reassuring. And uh, to run very quickly through the rest of the list, I mean, you know, what, what's important about donor funding? Why do we need to get money from donors? Because it gives us room to experiment. It gives us room to do things that we wouldn't necessarily have the chance to do within the context of our, of our, of our daily um, routines. We can build new skills through it. Um, we can learn to do, uh, we can learn from partners, we can learn from beneficiaries even. You know, there's um, lots of opportunities to build um, one's knowledge and understanding. We can get money to reach new audiences, we can build new platforms, we can uh, invest in, in boosting content. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities that, again, uh, a limited operating budget won't allow you to do. Uh, it gives us greater profile and track record, which is important in applying for funding from the same source or elsewhere. I think it's extremely important and beneficial, again, to be able to develop models that can be used and reused. Um, once you've got it up and running, then you have the opportunity to use it again. And it's getting it to the kind of um, to critical mass that is the challenging part and donors can help you do that. And building the partnerships, particularly in country, but also regionally that are a benefit to you and that allow you to kind of exchange experience uh, and skills and ideas and, and remain creative. Uh, I think, you know, again, there's a kind of donor funded community that has the opportunity to build these ideas and build this knowledge that, uh, that, can, uh, that, that can subsequently be shared. Uh, and... Um, Finally, this interest, the, the, the issue of public interest over commercial imperatives. Obviously, donors are not asking for a, return, a financial return on their investment. So you get the opportunity to address themes that um, if you are an organization dependent on advertising, that you wouldn't necessarily get otherwise. Um, just to give you a sense of what I, in my view, um, the bigger donors are looking for in proposals. Um, and the things you know that you really need to pay attention to as you put proposals together, um, you must you must do what they're asking you to do. You must align your idea to their goals and priorities um, because if you don't, you just massively reduce your chances of winning. You need to be able to make those links between what they say they want to fund and what you are planning to do. And it sounds very simplistic to say that, but I suspect it's the single biggest reason why uh, proposals get rejected. Um, they're looking for partners they can trust, so they want you to demonstrate, as I said earlier, that you uh, can be relied upon and you can deliver projects uh, to their satisfaction, both financially uh, and professionally. And in that respect, they're, they're, they're clearly looking for, for value for money. And, and of course, you know, this is a misused term. It doesn't mean that you should be producing stuff on the cheap, quite the opposite. You know, you should be putting in the real costs, but you need to demonstrate that you're cost effective. You need to demonstrate that you're efficient. And very importantly, and again, much overlooked, you need to demonstrate that you are being uh, equitable, you know, that you are reaching different groups, uh, that you are um, using donor funding in order to bring maximum benefits to society in the round. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about innovation again, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I mean, they're looking for it, of course, how you, how, how you satisfy that lust, I don't know. Um, and, and in the proposals, yes, it's, it's, it's being clear, it's telling a story, uh, it's a logical progression, it's about building uh, a log frame uh, and then everything else cascading down from that. Um, it's ticking yourself off against the gu guidelines, making sure you haven't missed anything in terms of the number of partners, the size of the grant, the geographies, all of those different things you need to take into account. Um, and your approach needs to be viable. They need to be able to see that this could actually work, that you have sufficient resources to deploy, that you have the technology, you have the platforms, you know, all of the things that you've said in your proposal will be deployed in order to, uh, to, to, to make the project happen and to make it, um, to give it the best possible chance of achieving its goals. And personally, I think presentation is extremely important. I'm actually going to jump this one because it's dull. But on the final slide, 
um, I would jump straight to this last point, which are my kind of, you know, uh, tips, if you like, for successful proposal writing. You really need to think about someone <laughs> wading their way through dozens of these proposals in, in, a, in a relatively short period of time. And I've sat on evaluation committees and it's pretty soul destroying, let me tell you, because... <laughs> Uh, but because of presentation, broadly speaking, because people cram far too much information into a very small space. And I know that donors are their own worst enemy because they insist on unreasonable um, page lengths or character um, counts um, and so on and so forth. But, you know, you're, we're journalists. We're really good at presenting complex, uh, complex ideas in a, in a simple way. We're really good presenting ideas and a logical progression, you know, that draws the reader in uh, and allows, you know, that whole picture to unfold as they read. So I, I do think you need to think about people reading it uh, and, you know, put in paragraph breaks, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and, and they will see, uh, anyone who's done any evaluation work will, will see with your copying and pasting projects, if you're just using this incredibly dull language that you've taken from dozens of other proposals you've written, you know, they need to feel you're writing for them. Uh, and, um, and to be honest, you know, copying and pasting is not a particularly rewarding exercise for us either. So, uh, you know, build as much originality into your pieces as you can. I think it's massively important to pitch the project as early as possible in the proposal, even if the structure of the application form doesn't allow for it. I think you've got to find a place very high up to put in three or four paragraphs exactly what you want to do and why you want to do it, um, like a, an executive summary. It's, it must be in there because it will then allow them, the evaluator, very quickly to orientate him or herself within the landscape of the project and everything else then becomes clear otherwise there you know it becomes a kind of investigation in itself you're going to it's all guesswork you know until you finally arrive way down the the, the, the narrative of what the project is actually trying to do um but i see a lot of proposals that that, that have this that this very hard sell of the organization involved you know that uh it's all about how wonderful we are, what incredible work we've done, how much everyone loves us. But uh, but still, you've got to demonstrate you can do the project, you know, that, that, that the project makes sense uh, and, and will make a difference. You know, um, the fact that you're a great organization is, of course, important in your ability to deliver. But um, there is plenty of great organizations that deliver, pro that, that, that implement projects that, uh, that don't have the kind of resonance that was expected. So it's not just about you and, uh, and, and how great you are. It's, it's, it's about the idea. Um, um, the next points, I think, have been kind of covered. I mean, it's about delegating skills. It's about the, the sequence of events, um, the quantifying of kind of, you know, what you're um, planning to do. So it's all extremely clear um, what you, uh, it, you the, the, the breadth of your ambition, if you like, the scope and the focus of what you're going to do. And I think people are too nervous about committing to figures in application forms, you know, terrified that it will be an infringement of their, uh, of their contractual obligations if they don't meet those figures, you know, when the time comes. Now, clearly, any proposal written um, is done, you know, on the basis of the information you have at the time. Uh, when you come to an implement, things will change. There'll be some things you can do and some things you can't. You'll be able to do more of one activity and less of another. I think you know these things need to be taken into account. So commit to figures. Why not in the application form? And then pedal back on them like crazy <laughs> when the time <laughs> comes. I'm joking, but you know, the, of course, you know the the the, um, the negotiation with the, with the donor is ongoing. Should be ongoing throughout a project life cycle. And if you can. Um, provide a solid rationale for making any changes to what you set out to do, donors will accept it um, because they recognize the situation evolves. Um, the, the, the rest of these issues we've covered, the one I would uh, highlight is, um, is scoring your proposal. So most donors have an evaluation matrix, so you'll be able to see how many points they are awarding to different aspects of your, um, of your proposal. Uh, I would actually get someone, a friend, colleague, a relative uh, to come in and just, you know, as a, as a fresh pair of eyes, um, score it against that evaluation. You know, have you done those things to, to the satisfaction of someone 
who doesn't know about you or your project. Um, and you know that, that can make a, a very big difference. So I think I've done my time. <laughs> uh, thanks very much for your patience. Much. Thank you. Okay. That was enormously helpful. Um, can we have our slide deck back, please? Thank you. So those are great tips to keep in mind for really any kind of proposal. You know, that sort of clarity um, and really having empathy for your reader. This is something that we talked a lot about in the previous session, but this is why you, know, you do research to set up your proposal writing process so that you know who you're talking to, what their interest is, you know, who's the audience for this proposal and what do you want to say to them. Um, so the other piece of proposal writing is, is that sort of message, right? Your value proposition. What are the elements of a value proposition? What do we mean? Um, another way we might refer to this is a case for support, right? Your argument for why this work deserves philanthropic support. Um, and the kind of core elements of it, as I think of them, are uniqueness, urgency, and your qualifications to deliver on those. Um, as a program officer once said to me, I just want to know why this, why now, why you? So those are the questions that you have to answer in your proposal. So I think of this as, you know, in the kind of why this, framing it as a challenge or an opportunity, particularly if you're talking about a new organization or a new project, or you're just looking to define your mission. You know, what are you here to solve? I, mean, I, I kind of think that we tend to get bogged down in philanthropically supported work in, you know, sort of incrementalist thought, right? You know, foundations operate on sort of a, like, per <laughs> perpetual time horizon. You know, they're here to exist forever. So they can have really long theories of change. But I think, you know, in order to be competitive, you really have to present the sort of most audacious vision possible. You know, what would it take to solve your organization out of business? What would change fundamentally if you were able to marshal the resources you needed to work at scale? Those are the sort of things that you want to speak to in talking about the challenge or the opportunity that you're grappling with. You know, and, and this is a, a way to get at the urgency, too. You know, what's the inflection point you're trying to seize? Um, what is it that you need to address to make something fundamentally change? How are you going to do it? Um, you know, this is where you talk about your project activities um, or the, the kind of programming pillars of your organization. What are you doing? Why do you think it will work? What's, what sort of evidence are you bringing to this process? Um, who's doing it? Who are you? Who's the leadership of the organization? Um, remember that these sorts of major gift relationships are really about establishing trust and rapport. So giving a sense of your own background, the skills that you and your colleagues bring to a project or to your organization's work are really important to include in your kind of organizational overview or case for support. Um, the, you know, kind of why does this matter? So what? What's the impact of your project or your organization? Um, how do you know it's working? How, how do you kind of measure your progress towards the impact or the change that you want to make? Um, is it something you're looking to grow or is it sort of a you know, one-time intervention? So speaking pretty specifically to the project's impact is really important. As Michael alluded to, you, know, you have to sometimes put some numbers around that. You have to make some assumptions. Um, you have to under, you know, help an evaluator or a program officer understand how you arrived at that. You know, I, I think, as Michael said, you know, you have to have a rationale. This is part of good project design, right? Apart from fundraising, in order to know what you're doing, you have to think about, you know, what, what does your project involve? What kind of resources does it require? What are we going to look for? What do we expect to see as an output? So you have to think about all that. And, you know, as, if things change, life happens, right? We've all just lived through a pandemic where play, you know, plans changed radically. We thought we were going to be in a room together and we were on a Zoom together. So, you know, there are lots of ways. I mean, I think that actually was really helpful in some ways in helping remind donors and all of us that we're not always in control of everything. Um, there are, you know, life happens and we have to find a way to deal with it. Um, but it is, you know, as long as you're in conversation with a donor, don't be afraid to sort of, you know, uh, report on where you are toward that most audacious vision um, and talk about how you've had to change it. What, you know, what did you, um, what did you learn? What are you doing differently? And then the last piece of this is, you know, kind of where you spell out what you need practically, financially, right? You know, you need to know a dollar amount when you're putting together a proposal. You need to have thought through that budget. You know, what does it cost to do what you do? This is a real opportunity for donor education. We've had a lot of conversations in the previous session, in yesterday's donor grantee roundtable about the challenges of core funding versus project funding, um, overhead line items that really adequately resource 
are organizations, right, that allow you to pay people and keep the lights on. Um, so make sure that you kind of tell that story of what are the things that make your organization run? What are the things that are going to help your organization or your work grow? Um, be really candid about this. Use this as an opportunity to educate the donor about what this work really costs because, you know, as Michael said, as we've talked about, there's not necessarily a lot of fluency in what really goes into producing an investigative project, you know, the tremendous amount of labor that's required to do compelling storytelling. Um, and the key piece of this kind of case for support, your articulation of your need, you know, what do they get out of it? What are they going to see for it? How, you know, in your, in your kind of closing call to action where it's like, we need X from you, and here's what you're going to get out of it. You really want to be clear about that and make sure that that's speaking very specifically to what you heard from the donor or what you learned about the donor in your prospect research and in your relationship building process. And that's the other kind of piece that I would emphasize is, you know, this is, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, you know, we, we kind of, Slice off proposal writing is a piece of the fundraising process, but it's pretty organic. Um, and you know, I would say that you don't really want to sit down and develop that you know 10-page proposal or respond to all of those questions and technical requirements uh, without having at least tried to have a conversation with a person beforehand. You know, as, as we've talked about a lot, people give to people. People give to people they know. Uh, you're dealing with program officers, with evaluators who have jobs and bosses that they're trying to keep happy. So you can help them do their jobs well, and you can reach out to them to, you know, kind of get a sense of what's useful to them, what do they need most from you, um, in ways that will actually help your chances. So don't sleep on that sort of opportunity to relationship build and ask folks what, what they might need from you. Um, so we've got some handy dandy top 10 tips courtesy of Michael, um, which we talked through. Um, I've also included just some templates and some samples. You know, if you're not familiar with what an organizational budget looks like, with what a log frame looks like, there are resources for you. There are some, you know, technical pieces to some of this process um, where, you know, you can find some answers. Um, you know, GIJN's resource center, GFMD's resource fundraising guide, uh, offer some helpful templates. There are some other kind of tools um, out in the in the kind of greater world that can kind of help you think through impact, um, impact assessments, budgets, those sorts of things. 